If the New York Mets weren't back already, they certainly are now. A thrilling win in the desert to win their second series in a row, thanks to a clutch late home run by Francisco Alvarez. Kodai Senga was amazing as well. We have a lot to discuss on today's edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. Want to find my work? Follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Download the Sleeper app and use promo code Locked On. It will get up to a hundred dollars match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. Currently operational in over 30 states. Check out Sleeper today. Well, that was one of the most exciting games the Mets have had all season. And it's one of those games that makes you start to believe a little bit. Not to say that everything's fixed. Not to say that this Mets team is a team of destiny all of a sudden. You can't have that drastic of a take off of one game on July 5th that bled into July 6th on the East Coast. Yet, what we saw was one of those nights where you start to look at a club and they're finding ways to win and they're not finding ways to lose. For a team that was doing nothing but find those ways to lose all season. And the Mets had every excuse to lose this game. They won three in a row. They could have potentially won the final game of this series. Well-pitched game from from both sides. Kodai Senga was sensational. I'll be talking about him at at more length in the next segment because I really want to focus in on what he did. It was a a fantastic start. He gives him eight innings, um, was eager to go out there for that eighth, really wanted to get back on the mound and, you know, give the Mets all of, of the length that he could. He makes one mistake in the entire game, seventh inning, hangs one to Christian Walker, and it felt like that was going to be the whole game. It felt like it was going to be one nothing Diamondbacks, and you are again going to be poking holes in what the Mets have been doing uh, over the last couple of games and saying, oh, here's the same old Mets. You get a, a brilliant start from Kodai Senga, one of the best the Mets have gotten all year, and you waste it. But once again, for the second night in a row, it's Francisco Alvarez that picks up his starting pitcher. He's working behind the dish all game with these guys. It was Scherzer in game one, Sanga in game two. And he's the guy who delivers the clutch home run when you desperately needed it. It was a two-run homer to take a lead with Scherzer on the mound that allowed him to get his eighth victory of the season. And now he helps Sanga get his seventh with... Just a a remarkable turn of events home run. And the celebration was incredible, both after he hit the home run and all the celebrating he was doing in the dugout as the Mets turned in a two-out rally after it. But the home run and the at-bat that led to the home run is the story of the game because this kid is special. This kid has star power in spades, and he has a, a thrill for the moment to come through and to shine. And you are already imagining now when he's doing this in the regular season, a long future at the New York Mets where this guy could be one of those players that delivers in October and can really build a a legacy on that ability to come up with clutch hits. It's not to say that this guy's definitely going to be a star in October, but he certainly looks to have the makings of one. And you just hope that the Mets give him opportunities to get there and that you know he can really continue to deliver on this promise. But here's a, a kid that's got 15 home runs by the All-Star break as a rookie catcher who didn't play you know, as the starting catcher from jump. It took some time to, to really earn that job. 
and to get the consistent playing time. And if you remember back, there was an, at a bat against Josh Hader in a big spot where he looked completely overmatched. Here he comes up. Andrew Chafin carves through the first two hitters the Mets have. Uh, Starling Marte and Jeff McNeil. Four pitches. And so now here comes Alvarez. First pitch, not over anxious. Takes it, gets, gets a, into a 1-0 count. Takes a big swing. Doesn't connect. Sitting 1-1. Does a great job again, spitting on a bad pitch. Gets 2-1. Then there's a pitch at the bottom of the zone. It's close. Did actually hit. And it was called a strike. And now he's even. And he calls timeout. He gets his composure. He spits on a, a slider, which in the past, he's swinging through and the game's over. So he, he has a, an incredible at-bat to get himself just to full. And then to stay in the at-bat by fouling off you know, a really tough slider. And then he gets a sinker, and it's right in his wheelhouse. He goes with the pitch. It's on the outside corner. He hits it where it's pitched. He finds a barrel. He drives it, and he gets it out of the ballpark. And that home run is the type of shot that you remember about a young player's career where, where you look back on the highlights and that's a moment as much as the two run homer to give you a lead the night before was great. When you're down to your last strike and the starting pitcher has such a gutsy performance to be able to hit a home run like that, man, that is special. And then to Brett Beatty's credit, not to say that what he did was anywhere near the magnitude of driving a ball out of the yard. He falls behind. Oh, two. And is able to get a base hit and extend the inning. And then it's Mark Hanna, who could have been pinch hit for out of that DH spot earlier in the game. Could have gone to Daniel Vogelback. They could have gone to DJ Stewart when the Diamondbacks grabbed a righty to face him. They didn't. They stuck with Mark Hanna. It allows him to be up in this spot late in the game. And first pitch swinging, he drives one over all the outfielders' heads. Triple. Mets take a lead. And then you get to the ninth, or the bottom of the ninth, excuse me. David Robertson has to close the door. And this is, again, where I say maybe this team has a little bit of something. Maybe the luck has turned back in their favor. Maybe momentum is on their side. Because Dominic Fletcher drilled one. That time and fam runs down on the warning track. And then Corbin Carroll hits one back at David Robertson. Hits off his leg and ricochets perfectly to Pete Alonso. Corbin Carroll almost beats it out. That ball ricochets anywhere else on the diamond other than right to Pete Alonzo. Coral is on, or Coral, Carol is on first base. And that inning gets extended further. And as much as David Robertson did a great job and he gets a big strikeout to close the door and get his save, he looked a little bit gashed. You know, he here's a pitcher that has always relied on that cutter and he's throwing nothing but curve balls. You know, I, I think he was running on fumes a little bit, and you probably don't have them for the last game of this series, but guess what? You just won another series. As much as I want to talk about a winning streak to close out this first half, the bottom line that I've continued to harp on is just get back to winning series. And guess what? The Mets have just won two series in a row. They can make it a third one against the Padres, even if they drop the last game of this series. You're going to look at them going into that all-star break and think, all right, a couple weeks left in July. Maybe you can buy another reliever or two. And this team can go on a serious run. So uh, it, it was a night that Mets fans can look back on this season and remember what a victory for your club. Let's see if they can carry it over. And let's see if Kodai Senga can carry this over throughout the rest of the second half here. Because his last start of the first half is probably his best. I want to discuss that. And length of the next segment before we do, today's episode is brought to you by Sleeper. Are you using the Sleeper app for daily fantasy baseball? I am. Tonight, I had Pete Alonzo to hit a home run. That one didn't happen, but guess what? Pete's due. I'm going double or nothing on it again. I will be doubling down Pete Alonzo at home run in the final game of this series in Arizona. Maybe I should look at Francisco Alvarez again. Kenny Homer in all three games of this series. Sleeper is a place where you can lay a little bit of money on that. If you want 100% of your money on daily fantasy baseball, Sleeper is now offering up to a 100% payout 
for up to an eight pick contest. So choose as many as eight players that you like and pick more or less on your favorite baseball stats like home runs, strikeouts, hits, and more. Get your picks right and you could win big. Built-in group chat functionality is there where you can see and copy your group's picks with the tap of a button. Entries can be made in 30 seconds or less. It's that easy with safe and fast withdrawals. Currently operational in over 30 states. Use promo code Locked On and you'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. Currently operational in over 30 states. Check out Sleeper today. The New York Mets play the Arizona Diamondbacks again at 9.40 Eastern time. Catch every pitch of the Mets' hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on the SXM app. Just search Mets. Kodai Senga was awesome in this game. I think it's kind of needless to say when he gives you eight innings, but only four hits allowed. The only ball really struck hard was that home run he gave up to Christian Walker. He only walked one. He got 12 strikeouts. He threw 107 pitches to get through eight innings, and 72 of them were strikes. And what we saw a lot of in this game was Senga, you know, seeing batters who are maybe – expecting that ghost fork and in the past he probably throws it when he's sitting in a 2-2 count and he'll throw that ghost fork out of the zone and, and guys maybe are learning to spit on it instead of swing through it and here's a, a pitcher making an adjustment to the league adjusting to him you're gonna sit you know and, and take 2-2 or 1-2 well Kodai's saying he says you know what if you're on your heels expecting a ghost I'm gonna throw one 97 miles per hour right in the zone, right past you. And he did that a bunch in this start. It's incredible to see how when he's on, he's the nastiest pitcher the Mets have. And they have two first bout Hall of Famers in their rotation. But Max Scherzer and Justin Verland are at a stage of their career where they're getting by with intelligence as much as anything. Not to say their stuff's bad. They certainly still have you know, a strong pitch mix and, 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 you know, can dial it up at times and have great big breaking pitches, but they don't have the stuff that Kodai Senga does. Kodai Senga has to figure out all the stuff in between the years. He has to figure out how to attack major league hitters and major league lineups and be able to carry his stuff over and, and get through you know, five, six, seven, in this case, eight innings, face lineups two, three times over. But when Senga is on, when that ghost fork is disappearing, when he is dotting that fastball where he wants to, the slider, the cutter, whatever he he decides to go to for that given start, when you notice that Sanga is putting the ball where he wants to and is really attacking hitters and not nibbling, he is an incredible pitcher. He really is. And, and you look at his last you know, five starts, right? Goes up against Pittsburgh, seven innings pitched, two hits, one run. It was unearned, four walks, six strikeouts. Really solid performance. Goes up against the Cardinals, gets dinged with two home runs allowed, gives up four earned, makes it through six and two thirds, but has eight strikeouts, walks one. Goes up against the Phillies, four runs allowed, but only two of them earned, five and a third, six strikeouts. Last time out against the Brewers. Five innings pitch, two earned runs, eight strikeouts. And then you had this performance. Eight innings pitch, one earned run, 12 strikeouts. You wonder how often is he that guy? Because when you look at the end of May, he had a six inning, one earned run start. He had a seven inning shutout start where he gave up just one hit against the Phillies with nine strikeouts. That was one of his best outings. He's shown the ability to do it. He had the 12 strikeout performance against the Rays. But then there's the starts in between where he gets you through five and gives up, you know, three runs. And it's hoping that you start to get more of the brilliant stuff and, and he can really continue to improve. Yet, you look at what he's done. He's been the best starting pitcher in this Mets rotation this year, without a doubt. Without a doubt. If you told anyone in the Mets front office, First 16 starts for Kodai Senga. You don't know how he gets there, but here are the stats. He's going to pitch to a 3-3-1 ERA. He's going to get you 89 and two-third innings. And he's going to strike out 113 batters. I think a lot of people would have signed up for it. 
The fact that you have Kodai Senga under this contract, we have him for at least two more years at a reasonable $15 million. It's one of the best contracts on the books. And we'll see if he pitches his way to opt out of that deal after year three. But right now, he is a steal. And what you love about Kodai Senga is when he has a performance like this one, just imagine, okay, let's just say the miracle happens. And this Mets team digs themselves out of this hole and finds themselves in a wild card series. And I've discussed this on the show in the past. Last year, game three, it was Chris Bassett starting. And as much as Chris Bassett is the guy that helps you win 101 games, and you can make an argument last year, no starting pitcher was more responsible for the 101 win season than Chris Bassett was. Took the ball every fifth day. He was great in the regular season. But he had essentially two playoff starts. One against the Braves to try to clinch the division and get that by. And then one against the Padres. And he dropped the ball and was knocked out of the game early in each outing. So that's like that can't happen to Kodai Senga. But he just went up against a very good Arizona Diamondbacks lineup. who put up four runs against Max Scherzer in game one. And he was able to deliver that kind of a performance. And the one other thing I'll say about Kodai Senga, it does seem like when he gets that rest and pitches how he's been comfortable and accustomed to throughout his career, you know, he's pitching once a week. Man, the guy is a, a special pitcher. So you do have to weigh that. You look at the other 12 strikeout performance he had, he started on May 11th, and then the 12 strikeout performance was on May 17th. So that's what, 12, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th. So, I mean, was that six days rest, five days rest? Apologies, it's 1 o'clock in the morning Eastern time. Um, counting, not my strong suit. Math, not good. But it's extra rest, and he's able to deliver. A nine strikeout performance against the Phillies where he gives up just one hit, no walks, no runs. Got an extra day rest. So there's something to that. And when you get Jose Quintana back, you have to wonder how the Mets try to juggle it. And can they keep getting him extra rest? Or do you hope that by keeping him on that every fifth day schedule, eventually you're going to get that out of him? Because when you get to the playoffs, if you get, I should not say when, still massive if there. But in a playoff scenario, I, I guess you want him to be able to, to throw it every fifth day. Um, but again, the bottom line is, let's just say you're bridging the gap from the end of the season to a wild card round, and he does get that rest. Maybe that's something the Mets even consider near the end of the year. They can. And you get arrested, Kodai saying in a game three of a wild card round. I really like the Mets' chances. So that's just some food for thought. But what he showed us in this game, moving forward, I think that's a pretty big takeaway about what this team can be. So uh, we're going to discuss, though, Francisco Alvarez a little bit more in just a minute here. Before we do, another word from our sponsors. The New York Mets play the Arizona Diamondbacks one more time at 940 Eastern time tonight. Jerry Pitcher, the Mets hometown broadcast with Sirius XM. On the SXM app, just search Mets. Now, this segment's going to kind of lead into tomorrow's show. I'm actually going out of town. So, I will be recording Friday's episode of Locked On Mets right after this. And it will be a Friday Farm Report where I want to look at each of the baby Mets. The two that are on the big league roster and the two that are in Syracuse. And discuss what the second half is going to look like for these guys. And the roles that they're going to potentially play and try to go on this run. But you can't watch a game like we just saw and watch the last two nights and not spend a segment talking about Francisco Alvarez. This kid's special. He's really special. And the stats at this point, they might not completely jump off the screen. He's hitting 221 on this season. 276 on base, 487 slug. It's not like he is a, a, even a candidate for rookie of the year. You look at his last 15 games, a 163 average, 
234 on base, 395 slug. Expanded to his last 30 games, 167 average, 216 on base, 427 slug. But in his last 30 games, he has eight home runs. And in his last seven, he has three. And on the season, he has 15. If you have a guy that has an eight home run month, which is what over the last 30 days or games Alvarez has done, that's really special regardless of the position. Just do the math on it. You have 162 games in a season. Let's say you play 150. Eight times five. Here's Ryan trying to do math again. 40 home runs. Alvarez, right now, through 62 games played, sitting at 15. Doesn't take a genius to to understand that basically on pace for a 30 home run season as a rookie catcher. As a, let me say that again, a 30 home run season as a rookie catcher. Yes, you want to see him hit higher than 220. You want to see him get on base at a 340, 350 clip not a sub-300 clip. There has been big peaks, big values. But the peaks have been special. And the home runs have been clutch. The energy has been palpable that he brings to the ball club. Just watch him high-five Brett Beatty when he comes around to score that eventual or actually what turned out to be the winning run. He's into it. He's working hard behind the dish. He has proven to not be a liability whatsoever defensively. And when you have a guy that can be, honestly, he's been their best defensive catcher this season. I feel like I've liked him more behind the plate than Tomas Nito and Omar Narvaez, two guys who are on this team strictly for their ability to defend. But he blocks really well. He plays really hard. He frames as good as anyone. He's just a complete package when it comes to what he can bring to your ball club from that position. And I remember Arm Layton coming on my show prior to the season, I think. And he said, you know, Alvarez could be a Mike Zanino type catcher for you right now. Look at the offensive profile in that season that Mike Zanino had when he was an all-star for the Rays. They pull up the exact stats. Comparison is actually pretty strong. Uh, 2021, he hit 33 home runs. He hit 216, 301 on base, 559 slug. You know, that's, he also got MVP votes, funny enough. That's the type of player that Alvarez can be for you this year. And that's why he's earned this starting catching job because he's been great defensively and he can change a game with a swing of the bat. If you look at the Mets lineup right now in the home run threats. I think we've actually gotten to the point that it's Pete Alonzo one. And then the Francisco's might be tied as a two A two B. Lindor and Alvarez. And Alvarez is close to Lindor. Lindor's at 17, Alvarez at 15. Far less playing time. So maybe Alvarez is the 2A in that Francisco uh, you know, tie there. But the moments that he's had in this series, it makes you feel so good about the future of this ball club, regardless of where this season ultimately ends up. Because the battery of this game, Kodai Sang and Francisco Alvarez, are two guys that will be a big part of this ball club for years to come. And that's something to be very optimistic about, no matter how pessimistic this season has led us to be. On tomorrow's show, I already mentioned it, I'll be extending this conversation as it relates to the baby Mets, talking about Brett Beatty, I'll spend a little more time on Alvarez, Ronnie Mauricio, and Mark Vientos, and what their roles can be on this club throughout the second half, and what to expect from them. So make sure you follow, rate, and review so you don't miss that one. Subscribe on YouTube. Follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan, and follow the show, Locked on Mets.